Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Every punk in this town is scared stiff. They say he can't be killed. They say he drinks blood. Is there a six-foot bat in Gotham City? Vicky Vale. Bruce Wayne. And what do you do for a living? He's a tired old man. Can't run this city without me. Your luck is about to change. Terrorizes. Wait till they get a load of me. He's out there right now. And I've got to go to work. Pod bay doors are open. I am your host, Doug Heller of TalkMovieToMe.com, also the co-host of the Cave of Wonders podcast with Jerry Roberts, who is seated across the country from me. Give us your information, Jerry. I am Jerry Dean Roberts from ArmchairCinema.com and also ArmchairOscars.com. And Doug, I have a question for you. Is there a six-foot bat in Gotham City? <laughs> and if so, is he on the police payroll? And if so, what's he pulling down after taxes? If you have, well, we're talking about Batman today, and I'm honestly, yes. I, Doug, got, Doug picked this picked this one because um, it's one of his favorite movies, and I like it too. So <laughs> we're gonna be talking just a little bit about Batman. The, the original Batman. There are a hundred Batman movies, honestly. Well, uh, we're talking about the Tim Burton, <laughs> Michael Keaton. Nineteen eighty nine. Nineteen eighty nine. Not, not technically the original Batman. Not technically. There, there no. was a serial. There was a serial in nineteen forty three. Another serial in nineteen forty nine. And then the uh, Adam West, uh, Burt Ward uh, movie in nineteen sixty six that was done between seasons one and two of the uh, of the television show. If there's, I, I was I was thinking about this the other day. Now, a little behind the scenes here, I work in a bookstore, okay, and we have a television set up, and one of the things that we uh, we do is we'll we'll have a movie running. Well, the last week or so, they've been running Batman. So this movie mm. has been firmly ingrained in my brain for like two weeks. So <laughs> I'm I'm itching for this and. One of the things I was talking to uh, a guy the other day about the actors who played who played Batman, and there aren't probably as many. I'm talking about live action. Probably aren't as many as that mm -hmm. have played like Superman. Um, Batman's a little more localized, yet his universe is all over the place. Oh yeah. Because there's the um, there's the '60s Batman, the comic book Batman, both incarnations, mm -hmm. uh, before and after Frank Miller. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of there's this movie, you know, the Michael Keaton. There's the Val Kilmer. There's the George Clooney. There's the the um, um, Christian Bale. Christian Bale. Then then there's then there's uh, Ben Affleck. He has all kinds of universes. Depending on who's playing him, mm -hmm. um, and all kinds of iterations and, and, and changes in the character, and it's rarely ever consistent. This is a 
the streamline of Batman's story is always consistent, but the character changes depending on the actor who's playing yeah. him. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know a little bit more about Batman than I do, but, I mean, would this be your assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think that each actor that plays him definitely brings a uh, a unique take to the, the character. Mm-hmm. Um, they always try to play him at least close to... at least similarly, um, with the exception of George Clooney. Or Adam West. And Adam West. Um, Adam West talked about the show... In a, in a podcast I heard uh, a couple years ago about, it was like the, the 50th anniversary mm-hmm. of the show. Yeah. So I think it was last year. Last year. And, um, and uh, so it, that would be 2016 for anybody listening far off in the future. <laughs> um, so, uh, and he said that he was drawn to the... Uh, the piece because of how funny it was or how funny he understood it to be so he called it the uh, light night. he played it right they played it for comedy so that it could teach a lesson to kids but make adults laugh yeah and it also um, fit in the world because at the time um this was in the mid 60s it was like um that was the time of the beatles um mm-hmm. andy warhol you know all of this in television was Television hadn't gotten dark yet. Um, mm-hmm. It was goofy, gimmicky sitcoms, so it fit right. for that and it time. Was, yeah, it did. It really did, and and it was, and it fit with the Batman of the time too, right. because by the by the mid '60s, Batman had gotten off the rails, goofy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it in in one episode, in one issue uh, of the comics in the '50s. Uh, Batman literally turned into a buzzsaw, and Superman had to figure out how to change him back and remind him that he was a person before he went berserk and cut everything up. Yeah. Well, this movie, so, this movie comes from um, a reiteration of the character, a reinvention of the character. I believe it was mm-hmm. 85, 86 with um, 86 Frank Miller. it was 86 when the when the Dark Knight Returns the Dark Knight came Returns. out 1986 this is based a mm-hmm. little bit on that because that that was trying to deal with a Batman or Bruce Wayne that was older um, that was dealing with a world that was far more violent and was trying to um, and I'm going to quote Frank Miller give Batman his balls back <laughs> pull him this... out of that 60s pop culture which had become such a joke right and and it it, sh- it should be said that the the um what was it uh dennis o'neill uh writer dennis o'neill and artist neil adams uh did a lot to reconfigure the character in the 70s uh-huh. um before the the crisis on infinite earths in the mid 80s and then Frank Miller uh, in 86. Um, because the, the DC Universe was always, uh, before the New 52, came out in 2011, and Rebirth just happened at the end of 2016, uh, was defined by pre-crisis and post-crisis. Yeah. And they had made all the Golden Age stuff part of Earth 2, and kind of shunted that off as no longer part of Earth 1 canon um so that's why uh jay garrick was no longer considered the first flash it was always barry allen on on earth one yeah and um and the crisis on infinite earths reconfigured a whole lot of the characters batman included and made him darker to fit with where frank miller was going Mm -hmm. so the post-crisis batman fit up with frank miller's batman and uh this movie comes out three years after that, so it's stemming off of The Dark Knight Returns, the vibe at least, without going anywhere near the older character and the and the uh, the storyline. Um, it it really took that vibe of a darker Gotham mm-hmm. and a darker Batman, um, and 
And I always, I think that Michael Keaton does an excellent job. I remember, I'm going to say, I, I'm a little bit older than you. Um, I remember, I, and you remember this too, but I particularly uh-huh. remember when that announcement came down. Now, there was no internet at the time. But when mm-hmm. people heard Michael Keaton, there was no real outrage. The general consensus was, really? Mr. Mom? Because it's Mr. Hard. Mom, Beetlejuice? It's hard to remember now. People forget uh-huh. that before Batman, he was a comedian. He made yeah. light comedies, generally. Very light, you know, yeah. He mm-hmm. started, his first, his first hit was Night Shift. You know, you remember mm-hmm. when they were they were um, he and Henry Winkler were pimps running a operation out of the out of the New York City morgue. You know, love Brokers. Yeah, you know, wasn't that, that wasn't that Ron Howard's first film? It as a wasn't director? his first, but it was the one that put him on the map. It was his second. Yeah, 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 yeah. The first was Grand Theft Auto, and he. Right. Uh, but he he was a light comedian, and he was a good comedian. Mm-hmm. And he made all these yes, he movies. Was. He made Mr. Mom, and he made that. He made mm-hmm. he made the Dream Team, and all of these. And, and and Beetlejuice, also directed and by Beetlejuice. Tim Burton. Yep. And Tim Burton's second film. Yeah. And but so it was an odd choice. And I think really Tim Burton was just going with an actor he was comfortable with. Rather than well, trying to find that, a hulking you know Right. More and and clothing. at at the at the time, um the 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 male physique wasn't what it has been idealized as now. Yeah. Um, you know, you didn't have people that looked like Chris Evans and Chris Hemsworth, mm-hmm. Chris Hemsworth, and you know, the they musculature wasn't like that unless you were a bodybuilder. And the biggest um, actors that at that time were like Michael Ke- or like uh, Michael Douglas. You know, right. like somebody who and, was a little more normal so to speak. Right. Uh, and and the other thing, like, I think Tim Burton was seen as an odd choice for Batman as well, mm-hmm. given that he was an animator, and then he made Pee-wee's Big Adventure, and then Beetlejuice. Right. He was a stylist. Not a, yeah, very much so. And um, so the those two choices were, were peculiar, and the saving grace in the casting announcements was Jack Nicholson as the Joker yeah. because everybody went, Oh, uh, so they work. made one choice people that'll didn't work. like, and then one that no one could deny. <laughs> right. Although exactly. at the time I so, made the, although at the time I made the, uh, I, I made the point that I thought that, uh, Tim Curry would have been perfect. And he might've been, and he might've been, he, he might've been, wouldn't have had the same impact um, as Jack Nicholson, but right. Right. And I, well, looking, I think, looking, I think back some... on it, looking back on it, Tim Burton seemed perfect for this, based on what Frank Miller had done. He seemed perfect right. for this. Well, and now, now that we've seen the rest of his oeuvre, yeah, he's perfect for it. Yeah. But at the time, he hadn't developed any of that yet. This was, mm, this was a year know. before Edward Scissorhands. I don't know. If you look at Beetlejuice and you look at Pee-wee's Big Adventure, yeah. the style was there. I mean, he well, was sure. very much in especially in, especially in Beetlejuice. Yeah. Um, but he was. But the the, they weren't serious films. No. They weren't. They weren't. Um, you wouldn't have known um, that he would be able to pull off something as dramatic and action after Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Beetlejuice. Right. They were they were visual and comedy and especially Beetlejuice was all about the the visuals. I still don't really like Beetlejuice that much. I love but, Beetlejuice. Uh, <laughs> I saw it when I was uh, well. That came out what in eighty seven? Eighty eight. Just a year before. Eighty eight. I was yeah. I was seven years old when I saw Beetlejuice. I didn't. Beetlejuice. Well, here's the thing, though, going back to Michael Keaton, is that Michael Keaton had done nothing but comedies, except a movie he made a year before this, um, which was a movie called Clean and Sober. I was going to say, was that Clean and Sober? And he, yeah. he really, I think that, in, the, in essence, if you follow his career, really sets him up for this role. 
because mm-hmm. it's that's a deep dramatic role he plays a stockbroker who's addicted to drugs and mm-hmm. um, uh, then you know he was trying I guess to turn his career in a different direction not be the clown all the time it's like every actor does that mm-hmm. they're like I want to be something else I want to try something else and he did a good job and so in that way I think he was perfect for this however yeah however this movie isn't really about Batman. This movie is very, very little about Batman. He's kind of the lesser role. He's kind of the second biggest role in the movie. And that's because of Jack yeah. Nicholson. I, I think it's, it's partly because of Jack Nicholson, and it's partly because, and we were talking about this before, that Tim Burton doesn't identify with heroes. No, no. He likes his oddballs. Um, he identify. He likes his oddballs, and he likes he likes the the more um, off center, uh, villainous kind of shady character, uh-huh. um, which is borne out if you specifically in Beetlejuice his, and later uh, on in something like uh, Sweeney Todd or something to that effect, um, and uh, it. Uh, he he didn't really pay attention to Batman because he doesn't. He never paid attention to his heroes. Um, and then when when he tries to identify with the hero, uh, which he tried to do um, with uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, kind of falls flat. Because um, he's trying to turn the hero into an oddball. Uh, right. And even does that with Dark Shadows. Well, yeah, I mean, Dark Shadows had its own problems. Long, I mean, <laughs> uh, outside of Tim Burton, that had its own problems. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's, and and the funny thing is that like Batman is probably the oddest hero that he could he could have tackled. Yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely not a run of the mill kind of superhero i mean he doesn't have any superpowers but he's 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 a man a very intelligent man who dresses up as a bat and beats up criminals how odd is that it's weird yeah but he doesn't play that up he doesn't amp it up he only comments on it through joker I don't know what what went into his selecting or choosing to take the job. I don't know if it was the money or the prestige or what. He he said he didn't he didn't read comic books. Right, and that's but, very evident, honestly. But but here's the thing: um, what director would want to handle this property? Because it's a you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, yeah, I'd love to portray Batman. This is a massive undertaking. Batman always because is. Because you've got a, you've got a lot to work with. Mm-hmm. And you've got a lot to, you've got a lot riding on it. And if it fails, you know, it, when a movie fails, it almost, it almost invariably always follow, falls on the director. Yeah. Um, directors have fallen before. You know, mm-hmm. Michael Cimino, you know, Barry oh. Sonnenfeld with uh, Wild Wild West. Mm-hmm. You know, the movies... If they're such a colossal failure, it can ruin your career. Yeah, it can. You don't want to fail with Batman. No. You don't want to fail with Batman. Even Schumacher has never really come back from Batman and Robin. N- no. You, you don't want to fall off the off the wagon with this one. Right, right, and and uh, because Batman is such a a rich character and so beloved, a beloved character. Yeah absolutely the 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 most popular uh dc hero um by a long shot um mm-hmm. possibly and, the most popular comic book character oh absolutely yeah i mean uh, and so like even even more recently the the ben affleck was going to be doing he signed on to write direct and star in the dceu batman standalone and he's working on the script and he gets to a point where he's just like 
I can't put the focus that I need to in being Batman and also being behind the camera. The script wasn't coming yeah. together, so he's like, I need to step back and just play the part and bring in another director because I can't he didn't he didn't think he could do justice to the to the character by playing all those roles behind the scenes as well. And it's a, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. It's a difficult undertaking for a regular movie to yeah. to be an actor, director, and writer. Uh, I don't know how Clint Eastwood ever did it. I mean, uh, he would you know like Unforgiven. He's not only the director, but he's also the the star and the producer. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, how in the world? I mean, I don't. I and then when you get into people like Woody Allen, who wrote, directed, writes, directs, and stars in his movies, or Orson Welles, who wrote, directed, produced, and starred in his own movies, Charlie Chaplin, Chaplin, Chaplin wrote, produced, directed, starred, and did the music for his movies. Um, although Chaplin is a little bit suspect because, um, he would have gag writers for himself, but say that he came up yeah. with everything. Um, the screenplay for Monsieur Verdu was actually written completely word for word by Orson Welles, but, uh, Chaplin took screen credit and gave him a story credit after, after mitigation with the Writers Guild. Because he he explained yeah. to Orson like you you have to understand I'm known as doing everything myself so I can't give you screenplay credit but I'll give you story credit. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and they were good friends. Well, regulations nowadays it would never allow that. No, no, but they and they were close friends and he's like this movie would this script would be perfect for you, and and Chaplin kind of screwed him out on that deal. Well, I think Tim Burton one of the virtues of this film is that Tim Burton is only allowed to go so far. Um, there's... And then we see the, why the in Batman Returns. That, <laughs> the, evidence of that, the evidence of that is the movie that came immediately after this, oh. Batman Returns, which was fully his production. It was fully his um, his baby. He was allowed to do whatever he wanted, and that was a huge mistake. Right, because... Because the movie sucks. It was, it's horrible. It's just... <laughs> It's not a Batman movie. It's a Tim Burton movie. It's not a Batman it's, movie it's at all. It's so it's so goofy and like it's disgusting. Dark. It's disgusting. It's dark camp. And um, just recently, um, I sat my now thirteen year old son down and said, "We're gonna watch Batman." So I put on the eighty nine, and he really liked it. But I have that DVD four pack of all four mm -hmm. of the 80s, 90s Batman. So yeah. Batman comes out at the end, he really likes it, in goes Returns. And I'm like, ugh. ugh. So he watches Returns, and I said, what did you think of it? And and he's, he's on the autism spectrum, so most of the time he either loves or likes a movie, if he gets to see it. He's only recently started to say, no, I don't like this movie. He gave it. He gave it a. It was an okay movie. Like he he was into it for a point. I think he just liked it because of Michelle Pfeiffer. And yeah. then we watched. Wouldn't. Well, the way he screwed up Cat. Well, I just, I can't talk about Batman Returns right now. Um, it's, it's too painful. That's another show. Yeah, and and then we watched Batman Forever, and he's like, yeah, that was okay. It was it was better than the second one. And then we watched Batman and Robin, and he gave it a huge thumbs down. He's like, this was terrible. Yeah. Like, and that's kind of how it goes. Like, uh, Forever was at least entertaining and had some really good action sequences. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But <laughs> the, I the, hate the that villains movie. are terrible. <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones is too far over the top. Jim Carrey isn't funny. I said to I said to my son, I said, What did you think of Jim Carrey as the Riddler? And he goes, I don't like him. I said, Do you think he's funny? He goes, No. I said, Thank it's you. It's a Jim Carrey vehicle. It's a Jim Carrey vehicle with Jim Carrey playing the Joker. Yeah, the it's is what just, is. it's he's He's so bad, and his one-liners fall so flat. Mm -hmm. And Tommy Lee Jones... Well, it's based on what he's given, because that script sucks. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Well, see, and and I and and I'm sure that this will come up again at some point, but um, in those later pictures, they they were written um, by none other than Akiva Goldsman, whom I hate. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a whole dude. This is a whole thing. You should know. He hates Akiva Goldsman. I <laughs> hate Akiva Goldsman. Every time I see anything that he's attached to, I end up having this unexplained anger until I see his name and then it's explained because I just feel just angry when I'm watching his stuff. There was a thing uh, that he produced. He didn't even write it. It was called Childhood's End on a sci-fi channel. It was a three-part miniseries, like two, two and a half or three hours each, each thing. And I'm sitting there watching the first part with my wife, who had already watched it, and she was like, oh, you'll like it. And I'm sitting there just seething. Just She's like, I've never seen you so actively angry at watching something. And she watched... <laughs> And she watched Dreamcatcher in the theater with me, and I wasn't, and I hated, I hated that. That was one, that was the worst movie of the aughts for me. Um, and she, even then, I wasn't as angry as I was when I was watching Childhood's End. And then I saw Akiva Goldsman, I'm like, oh, well, that's why I was angry. I almost didn't watch yeah. the other two parts. <laughs> so, well, he didn't write Batman, so that's a good thing. He didn't you know, write the first one. Uh, no, he didn't. This one was written by Sam Hamm and Warren's Garden, and um, it seems to borrow pieces and parts. This one seems to borrow pieces and parts from other places. There's a long, rich history of Batman that you can draw from. Oh, absolutely. But I think primarily where, where this one comes comes in is it draws its inspiration mostly from the Red Hood storyline. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with the Joker and all of that. And it's, I think it's trying to pull in an origin story well which, it does pull in an origin which, story which was written in oh let's see 87 or 88 in in the uh, the killing joke uh, Alan Moore yeah. the uh, the writer of Watchmen um, mm -hmm. which is quite possibly the greatest graphic novel ever written yes um, and made an equally good movie I don't care what anybody says look I agree with you but on that one... I loved Watchmen the movie <laughs> yeah uh, well, this one, it's, it's, what's interesting about this Batman movie is, is, and this would never happen today, is this movie is basically self-contained. Mm -hmm. um, you don't open the doors to a sequel. You don't open the doors to a... Um, you, you're not really opening the doors to a franchise, but you are dealing with Batman's essential beginnings. Mm -hmm. um, the training is not there or anything like that. Basically, the story is that he... Um, has become an urban legend. Right. He's been around for, uh, I think, a few months or maybe even a year, but nobody's he's really... scaring criminals to death. Right. Um, he's scaring not the, not the criminal, not the, the major crime syndicates, but he's scaring the, uh, the petty thugs. The street you know, the, level. The, the purse snatchers. The street, the street level. The crime. street level. Yeah. And he's scaring them, and there's an urban legend, you know, and, um, of course, you know, there's this whole thing, Batman doesn't kill people. Um, yeah. Uh, the essential element, and it's present here, the essential element to Batman, for me, is it resides at the end of Batman Begins, when he says, I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. Right. That is the essential element to how Batman does his job. Mm -hmm. And it's present here because he um, he holds the guy over the ledge and he says, I'm not going to kill you, but I want you to send a message. Mm -hmm. Because essentially that's what what this Batman is doing, is he's sending a message. Mm -hmm. he's, he's giving this, this crime-ridden, ugly, dirty filthy world that this Gotham City is contained in he's giving it a message I'm not going to let it go down the sewer right um, I'm going to I'm going to work my way up the ladder I'm going to I'm going to scare the criminal element to death mm -hmm. so that it has something to be afraid of right and I like that approach I like the the avenging angel mm -hmm. and that's um, that's really the core of Batman the character he uses right. he it's uncomplicated because... though 
Right, because uh, his his whole theme was that uh, that criminals are a, a superstitious lot, and that they are easily intimidated. So, if if you just scare them, they'll they'll start to go away, and <clears throat> largely he he is successful in street level crim- crime, and then the super villains come. Um, the problem that I always have had with uh, this and basically the on-screen Batman uh, from this on is the the guns on his vehicles. <laughs> the weaponry. <laughs> the fact that he uses real bullets... Now, in in Dark Knight Returns, he has guns on the Batmobile, but he shoots rubber bullets. Yeah. The fact that he actually shoots at the Joker, he targets him, he's using missiles, but he doesn't hit him for no reason. I don't like it, because Batman specifically doesn't use guns, because that's what killed his parents. Yeah. That is his absolute... He doesn't use them. He doesn't put them on. He has exploding batarangs that don't deliver a lethal charge. He, you know, he does all this stuff specifically to avoid using guns and killing. But because it looks cool, he's got guns on the Batmobile that shoots open a a garage door. He's got guns and missiles, machine guns and missiles on his, his bat wing which inevitably crashes every time um yeah <laughs> i don't know if you ever if you ever watch the animated um both the the batman the animated series uh and the justice league that kevin conroy uh voiced batman um every time he was in a batwing it crashed yeah. every time it in crashed. the animated series every time could well, not you keep never that saw thing him get his pilot's license that's true. <laughs> you know, you never saw Bruce get a pilot's license. You assume that he has one, but you never see him get it. Every every time um, he flies the Batwing, it crashes. Um, I, I don't know what the uh, was it the is it not the FCC, but the uh, the FAA regulations. Yeah, the FAA. I don't know what they think about the bat the the Batwing. I don't know if they've ever dealt with that. But <laughs> well, hey, the uh, in remember in the uh, on the TV show. Uh, he had his own private hangars, and he would just call the airport and say, "Get the bat copter ready, get the bat plane ready," and they yep. would have it gassed up and ready for him by the time they got out to the airstrip. So, yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about Nicholson because <sighs> um, Nicholson, to be honest with you, the Joker is just like the bat is just like Batman in that he goes through various incarnations based on who's playing him. Yeah. And the biggest thing with Nicholson is that the character goes from being a bouncy clown to being more wisecracking, and that's because of Jack Nicholson. Mm-hmm. And um, now a little bit of background: they paid him six million dollars for this for this role. Now Jack Nicholson's asking price at the time was ten million. Hmm. With a percentage, I believe, of the gross of the merchandising, and this man came away from this role with about fifty million dollars. Yeah, I was gonna say he he and he cleaned he up gives, on this one. But he gives a fifty million dollar performance. Yes, he does. Because he gives, he he really, and I'm, I I love Michael Keaton, I love Batman, but let's face it, Nicholson is the movie. If you don't have Nicholson in the movie, it loses a lot. Yeah, and and did you ever notice when you were watching it, especially now that it's been on repeat in your bookstore for two weeks, <laughs> how similarly and how how fun it was. To have Jack Nicholson and Jack Palance together in the same scene, in the same scenes, basically mocking each other. Yeah. In in their countenance and their tones, 
and and bouncing back and forth off of each other with uh palance doing his best nicholson and and nicholson yeah. doing his best palance it's it's and and i have a special affinity for jack palance because he actually lived um in a town about 20 minutes away from where i grew up he he retired to a to a little town called hazelton pennsylvania which is where i would go to a yeah. multiplex uh, that I, yeah. I I went I went to the movies in his town, so and he was like a local legend. When I saw, and here's another thing: I we have a big state, we have a big fair, uh, in a neighboring town as well. It's the biggest fair in in the state of Pennsylvania, in Bloomsburg, mm-hmm. and uh, Mickey Rooney came and and played the 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 fair. And it was his birthday, and Jack Palance came out because they were friends, and they brought a birthday cake out for Mickey Rooney because it was his birthday when he was playing. So I got to see Mickey Rooney and Jack Palance on stage together, and Palance nice. it, when when they were both uh, alive in in their 90s, 80s maybe in their 80s, Palance did the one arm push up. You know, it was <laughs> so. Uh, and, yeah, he did the one arm push up. If you, if millennials, if you don't know, Jack Palance won the Oscar in 1992 uh, for City Slickers. Um, for City Slickers, and when he got up on stage, he didn't bother to thank anybody. Um, he just he got confused and he he just sort of started blabbering on about nothing. And he said, you know, they don't hire me because uh you know because they think I'm too old. And then he says. Um, they forget that you, you you can do all of these things, and he gets on the floor of the stage and starts doing one arm push ups. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's. Um, and he was in his. It's 70s. one of the greatest Oscar moments. Yeah, it's, he was in his seventies, and even you know some of the younger actors were like, I can't even do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, and um, but that that to me that that's one thing that always sticks in my mind. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Jack Palance. <laughs> um, but this really. Jack Palance was, like you say, he was in his 70s. And he was getting older. And I think this movie really started a renaissance of his career, mm-hmm. which really culminated with City Slickers. Yeah. The only thing I hate about this, this movie with Jack, Jack Palance is that he's not in it very much. He's not. He's got two scenes, three scenes. Two or three, yeah. He's not in it very much. No. Yeah, and by the way, who hated, and he hated working with Tim Burton. I bet because um, he didn't like his his directing style. I'm sure, but yeah, I'm I'm standing there watching this movie at work the other day, and um, that scene is on, and um, I, I kind of walk by the movie and I kind of get mesmerized, and I'll stop while I'm on my way somewhere, and my my <laughs> my assistant manager gets in the radio <laughs> and goes, "Hey, sugar bumps, get back to work, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> I need you." you. You are my number one a guy. Are my number one a guy. Now don't forget, <laughs> your lucky deck. You know who I love in this movie. You know who I really, really <laughs> love in this movie. I love Bob. Yeah. I just love Bob, played by Tracy Walter. He's a wonderful actor. He's in all the Jonathan Demme pictures. Mm-hmm. He was in Silence of the Lambs. Mm-hmm. Um. But he was such a loyal goon. He was just he such was. a loyal functionary. And it's just, Joker just shoots him. Just, Bob, gun. gun. You Zip. Know? He just Come shoots on. him. Just... <laughs> I was like, this is your best lackey. I mean, you know. <laughs> and then he just hands he the gun off to the next guy. He might have li- <laughs> Gonna need a moment alone here, boys. <laughs> he might have need- he- he lived if, Bo- if, if, if he hadn't shot Bob. But, you know... Um, but uh, Nicholson just, he does all this great stuff. I remember, uh, Siskel Ebert's review of this, uh, Roger Ebert complained that basically Nicholson does the same thing over and over again. My defense is that's okay. Yeah. Because what he does over and over again is great. <laughs> you know, it's just one thing after the, and every time you see him, he's just doing something funny. And it's like, it's also... Played for laughs, but keeping to the character because it's sick. It's sick. The what? character is just... 
What kind of a world do we live in where a man dressed as a giant bat steals all of my press? This town needs an enema. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, he just, you know, the, um, uh, that scene in the, uh, in the museum. Oh. Oh, I could watch that scene over and over again. The yeah. scene where, um, he sends her a package. And by the way, we're going to talk about Vicki Vale here in a second, but Vicki Vale's got to be the stupidest character I've ever seen in my life in this movie. I mean, <laughs> who opens a box from the sent to you from the joker first well of all. look i mean it's <laughs> at least in the museum she didn't know it was from him yeah later in her apartment later in the apartment she knows it's from him she opens it up it's not to and then there's the the dead hand with the dead flowers it's like why did you open that why would you open a box from the joker just uh, after her boyfriend has been shot yeah. and then disappears and the first thing she thinks to do is go open a box that came from the Joker. Like, but anyway, the scene in the in the museum when they when um, when he and his goons show up, I will never ever for the rest of my life walk into a museum and not think, gentlemen, let's broaden our minds, <laughs> Lawrence. You know, and then that song starts playing, and that's just it's great because you see and you sense that Tim Burton and his creative team knew how to use Jack Nicholson. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't know how much of this was ad-libbed. I don't, I don't know if Jack Nicholson ad-libs at all. I don't think he does. Um, I know, I know he's a constant, I know he's very much a professional. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know how much of that was ad-libbed. I don't know how much of that was, um, was written for him, but he does just this great stuff. And um, that scene where he finally sits down with, um, he finally sits down with, <laughs> he finally sits down with Kim Basinger, and he does that whole thing, and she says, hey, what do you want? My face on the one dollar bill, you know? <laughs> I am the world's first fully functioning homicidal artist. I do what others only dream of. I make art until someone dies. I don't know if that was in the script or not. But if it wasn't, he's a better actor than I think he is. <laughs> um, and it's also keeping to the character. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, this character is, a like I say, he's more he's more a Bugs Bunny type than a, than, than, um, than what Cesar Romero would have done. Mm, yeah. Um, he's more wisecracking, always with the jokes, but always with a sick joke. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's... You know, the, 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 the scene, you know, he walks up to her and, you know, she's, she's got the flower and he, he squirts the flower and the acid just, you know, puffs on the right. wall. Mm -hmm. All of that. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, these sick jokes that he does. And that the, the sickest, though, for me, is when he shakes hands with the, the mob oh. boss. <laughs> I'm glad you're dead. That is a horrifying scene. Yeah. I'm he, glad uh, you're dead. He, he, <laughs> I'm glad you're dead. Yeah. Oh, you should know. You should also know this. That scene um, where he is talking to that charred corpse—that <laughs> was the first scene I ever saw from this movie. Really? And it was on—I believe it was on maybe sixty minutes. Mm. And I saw that scene, and I'm thinking, this is not going to be Adam West. Mm -mm. This will not be Super Friends. This is going to be something really really dark and that's what really got me hooked into well yeah it because i thought uh, because you know, this is going to be something really different you know they they finally did the joker the way that the joker was supposed to be um right and and actually the joker wasn't even supposed to be as big as he was um when jerry roberts uh actually created him or jerry robbins i can't remember what his what, what, Created it wasn't him. Gary Roberts. <laughs> I think it was also the same name, um, but uh, he was he was supposed to be he was killed off in the first ep in the first e uh, issue yes. he was in, and he got they got so many letters that they brought him back. Uh, uh -huh. uh, Bob Bob Kane and and Jerry Robbins didn't want to. He, he wasn't supposed to be anything, 
and they just kept bringing him back and he became a, a fan favorite so uh-huh. um and they in the early ones he was as murderous as he ended up being later um it was right. that it was the goofiness that that just you know of the the 60s and just any anybody who was a criminal was just going out to steal stuff they weren't doing anything but stealing stuff in the original batman tv show that was it yeah they were just steal stuff and it was like you know there are other elements to crime guys than just yeah it's <laughs> just stealing something i tried to do a marathon of the batman tv show because i have the blu-ray box set of the whole three seasons all three seasons i, I couldn't do it i i even i couldn't yeah. do it i i had to break it up <laughs> Because it's just the same all episode you need over is the movie. and over. Just watch the movie and it's fine, you know. <laughs> just watch the movie. That's really all you need. I mean, it's, at, la- it's at not, least uh... at least that had a story that wasn't them stealing something. They were they were trying to to, yeah. to take over the UN. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, so the Joker finally became the murderous psychopath that he was supposed to be, and. Um, and it was it was great. He was dark, but he was funny, and he he thinks that the darkest things are are the best jokes, and yeah, it, you know, it, it, he Nicholson really did do a great job. When you when you when you accuse him of being over the top, it's because this character is always over the top. This and, character's over the top. Yeah. And and but I don't think Nicholson ever came back down from the Joker. Mm-hmm. Uh. It, because everything after this was straight over the top. Well, let's talk a little bit about his career because we you have to know that Jack Nicholson came out of the new Hollywood. Right. Very much. When the studio system when the studio system broke down in the sixties, uh, the late sixties, and um, you know more violent content, more sexual content, mm-hmm. profanity, things that were not allowed by the production code before that. Um, were finally making their way into American movies, and along with that were actors like Jack Nicholson. Mm-hmm. And he came along, and um, he was something new. He was this wild and crazy guy mm-hmm. coming coming out of deep Roger Corman's stock. Right, and he was you now he worked. He he paid his dues. Yes. Um, you know, he paid his dues. He made, you know, Roger Corman, Little, little, little Shop, Shop of Horrors. Um, you'll, you, you might want to know, he showed up on the Andy Griffith show. Mm-hmm. Um, he, uh, uh, but the big break, the thing that really um, kind of shook the world was Easy Rider. Easy Rider. Where he played this lawyer who um, was a drunk. Mm-hmm. And he hooks up with these two guys riding motorcycles to a uh, a drug deal. They, they they have a drug deal and they're driving cross country on their motorcycles. Mm-hmm. And he plays their their buddy that they pick up. Mm-hmm. And from there, there was something wild about him. Mm-hmm. There was something in his smile. There was something in his voice. He he had this he had this very laconic voice, mm-hmm. and he had this 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 temper about him. That was perfect, perfectly suited for the times. Yeah, and also sometimes he externalized. Sometimes he externalized like Easy Rider. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he internalized like Five, five Easy Pieces. Mm-hmm. And, and then he won an Oscar for um, for Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, but I think the crazy guy Jack really started with The Shining. Yeah, and that was in 1980. That mm-hmm. really was what what brought that. That yeah, reputation because he was around. he was pretty much he was he was the loon in that, and then he was a loon in the Witches of Eastwick, and then he was a loon yeah. in he was kind of crazy in terms of endearment and uh, all sorts of different stuff. And it's it's also worth noting he actually was a writer too. Um, yeah. he has he has a few scripts to his uh, his name, um, specifically the um, the monkeys movie Head. Which he co-wrote with Bob Raffleson, yep. and uh, his his <laughs> that movie is a head scratcher. It is, wow! It is if you really, love the monkeys, don't watch it. It is it is it's a it's an acid. Trip. They the, Raffleson wanted to do something very much different from the television show that he was also a director on, um, mm-hmm. 
when they made that movie and it is it is weird it is weird yeah. and the last thing it's that he's bizarre. credited as writing is drive he said which was his directorial debut um yeah well he directed um he actually directed the chinatown sequel he directed the chinatown James. sequel he also directed um going south but the last thing that he wrote was drive he said in 1971 which was his directorial debut yeah. um he's only directed four movies so, but Jack Nicholson is a legend in his own time. Yes. And he's retired now, but he was a legend in his own time. And that personality, that bold, beautiful, crazy man personality is why. He's one of the most original actors you've ever seen. Yeah. And I always say of this, and this is the supreme compliment that I can give Jack Nicholson. He is the only actor I can think of in my lifetime that we will still be talking about in 300 years. <laughs> Just a brilliant actor. He could do anything. Yeah. And he he could play over the top. He could he could underplay it. He was just a marvelous actor. Oh yeah. I mean And he was very good. He's very good in character roles. Mhm. Mm He's very good in as a leading man. Mhm. Mm um I mean, and he was always, and it was, this is the thing that uh, George C. Scott always talked about, the joy of performance. Mm -hmm. Jack Nicholson has the joy of performance. Yes, yes, he does. That's what makes him so appealing. Mm -hmm. He's he's magnetic to watch, and, and he is. in just about anything he's in, you don't, you don't begrudge him. Um, you're happy to see him, whether the movie is any good or not. Um, like the Witches of Eastwick. Uh, bucket, I, bucket list. Oh, ugh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, he's the only thing I liked about A Few Good Men. And I know I won't make any friends by saying that, but he's the only thing I liked about A Few Good Men. You know what? A Few Good Men has its moments. It has its moments. And they're, they're, mo all, and they're mostly they Jack, Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. <laughs> but as far as this movie goes, um, getting back to this one... Um, let's talk about a couple of the things that really do work in this movie. That really, really work, just besides Nicholson. And I was struck, um, seeing it again by the look of the film. Oh, yeah. Because it looks it's incredible. the city, Gotham City, is really, and by the way, the production design was the only thing nominated for an Oscar, and it was the only, and, and of course it won. Mm hmm. And, um,. It reminds me a lot of Metropolis. It borrows a lot from German expressionism. Yeah, it does. Where a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the city seems to be made up mostly of gas works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very oppressive. It's very kind steamy. Of atmosphere. Very very steamy. Very steamy. It's yeah, it, weird crime, and the streets are very narrow. Did you notice how mm -hmm. how narrow the alleyways and the streets? It almost seems like a small town. Yeah, and it's um, but it's an funny. Industrial town. It um, he also borrows a lot from film noir. Um, yeah, it, it, especially um, with the with the shadow, the use of heavy shadow, and um, the the just the the. The dirt on the streets, the paper, the newspapers blowing, you know, mm. and it's it's the the atmosphere is really really good. And he does a good job. Burton does a good job of populating the film so that you feel like there is this this city is drowning in its criminal elements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing at the very beginning of the movie that you'll notice if you watch the movie again, you'll notice. When the man and the woman and the kid, which, by the way, that was a um, a strange little double back because watch when you if you, when you're watching the movie for the first time, you think it's Bruce Wayne, right? And his parents, yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. Be somebody else. Um, but the one thing that I noticed is that when they're walking through and they're trying to get a cab because mm -hmm. they've just left the theater and they're trying to get a cab, and they're mm -hmm. trying to get home. They walk by all of this gray. Mm -hmm. Everyone is dressed in browns and grays and kind of almost drab colors, mm -hmm. especially as they start to get into the, the the bad part of town. You know where all the Which, drug addicts and all of the truth, truth are sitting around. Truth and, be told, all of Gotham is the bad part of town, but yeah, 
Yeah, but they walk through this arena, this almost um, area where the criminal element seems to have gathered. <laughs> um, and they walk by a prostitute. Which, as bad as this town is, if you think about it and you watch that scene, the prostitute focuses on the kid. Mm-hmm. If you notice, I yeah. mean, now that's pretty bad. Yeah. But the funny thing is, she's wearing a red shawl. Okay, she's wearing red. Mm-hmm. In the midst of all this gray. And it's almost like um, the criminal element and all the bad stuff is going on. It's as noticeable as this woman dressed in this, and nobody does anything <laughs> about it. Yep. You know, yeah. nobody's, you know, the cops, nobody's doing anything about mm-hmm. it. But it's right there in front of you, mm-hmm. on every corner, on every street, down every alleyway. There's crime, and nobody does anything about it. Even the well-meaning police chief can't right. contain this criminal um, scourge right. that's going on. Right. That's why you need that. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was interesting. That, that color just pops out like that. <laughs> And um, but the, the fact that she pro- propositions the kid was was really kind yeah, of interesting yeah. to me. Cause you can't like, you can't <laughs> ignore that when 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 she propositions yeah. a nine year old, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, anyway. fr- in front of his parents. Um, in front of his parents. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that that needs to be brought up: the production design is incredible, but th- this also. This film also houses um, Danny Elfman's greatest score. Oh my god. This has become the official, or unofficial, I don't know how you look at it, the official <clears throat> Batman theme music. Right. I mean, even... I mean, when you think of Batman, you think of this. Right. And I think you know. lar- largely it's it's due to its inclusion as the opening credits in the, ba- in the Batman the Animated Series, which yeah. um, they actually slowed down for the animated series. Um, mm-hmm. if you, if you listen to the opening theme in the movie, it's something, slower. something feels wrong cause it's a lot faster than it is on the animated series. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot faster tempo and they slowed it down for the animated series, um, which I think is better personally, but, mm-hmm. um, the whole score though is really, really good and atmospheric yeah. and it's not. It's not Danny Elfman goofy, yeah, which is why it's, it's, it's really, really good. <laughs> and there's only been a few times where I've been able to sit and be like, oh, that was Danny Elfman? Oh. Yeah. Because I usually don't like Danny Elfman's music. Because it's too... As, here's, the, here's the funny thing. Is, is that this score, you can remember this score. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't remember the score to Dark Knight. Mm-mm. As much as I love Dark Knight, you can't remember that score. Well, that's because Hans Zimmer. It's a lot of Hans Zimmer is a crap uh, <laughs> composer. I hate He's Hans Zimmer. He's all about mood. He's all about mood. Danny Elfman's more about overtures. The only time you remember a Hans Zimmer score is when he farms out a theme to somebody else. This is true. This like is the true. the Wonder Woman theme that Junkie XL did for for Batman v Superman is the only part of that score I remember. Because it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But this score, I mean, this has become one of the most recognizable pieces of music in pop in popular culture. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, and it's um, uh, it just the, it, it was the beats and the movements he, and the the tone that he struck with it is is unlike anything he ever did, and it's probably the best comic score since John Williams Superman score in seventy eight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he also kind of surprised everybody because he came from Oingo Boingo. Yeah. And everybody, you know, was this kind of sort of new wave band and it was um, it was it was kind of had its it was stylized and it was the music was the music is still great, by the mm-hmm, way. Mm-hmm. But then he just became this composer. And around the same time, he also started um, doing the music for the Simpsons. Mhm. And it was a new style. It wasn't all atmosphere. It was overtures. Right. But it was something new, and that's why I think this this theme stuck. I think that's why this um, 
um, this 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 musical score um, really stuck, mm-hmm. and why it uh, why it has lasted for twenty five years. Yeah, and um, but his it, it was so different than what what he what he normally did. Um, the way I always kind of felt about Danny Elfman was um, kind of it uh, expressed best in uh the family guy um star wars spoof blue harvest when uh at one point uh chris as luke turns john williams in the london symphony orchestra everybody and they play something and he goes now can you play uh this and he goes no but we can play the people's court theme and then he plays the people's court theme and then he comes back to his aunt and uncle who have been burned out and he's like oh no john williams great now we have to finish this thing with danny elfman and he does this upbeat <laughs> bum, 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 and he just takes out his lightsaber and cuts off his head <laughs> He essentially does Pee Wee score. Yeah, you know, and and he just and, uh, cuts off his head with a lightsaber. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of how I feel too. <laughs> Let's talk about the impact of this movie because people forget now that this movie, this was the second highest grossing movie of 1989, um, behind Last Crusade. Yeah, this thing made buckets of money. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was the most anticipated movie of the year. It was. The it was one of the most popular movies of the mm-hmm, year, mm-hmm. and I mean, everybody in the, everybody in the country went to see it. Yeah, I think even my grandmother went to see it. <laughs> and there was merchandising when you when the, there was merchandising. There was everything had that little symbol on it for months, and that was before the movie came out. Mm-hmm. You couldn't take three steps through a shopping mall without seeing something with Batman on it. Right. So this thing was being hyped up and promoted, I mean, for months before it came out. Mm-hmm. And when it came out, everybody in the country went to see it. It was and huge. And they loved it, and yeah. they went back to see it. Mm-hmm. It was huge. It was one of the only movies that summer that wasn't a sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it came out, um, there was a resurgence in Batman, a resurgence in his popularity because mm-hmm. it turned people's minds off of the campy 60s TV series. Right. And it had an impact that few other films ever had. Now, the one thing I've always been curious about is that knowing how Hollywood is, knowing their trends, knowing how they how they get hooked on a trend and they will beat it to death because mm-hmm. you have to remember at the time this was the late 80s um the big trend was turning old tv shows into movies um which well, some people blame this movie it's a good thing it's a good thing that they didn't uh that they didn't keep that up you know yeah yeah with with current trends but it's knowing knowing how they pick up on trends i was shocked that they didn't mine other properties yeah. Find other comic book properties. The right. only one I can think of in this at this time period was The Flash. And it was on television briefly. It was on CBS for a but season. Yeah, but maybe because of the failure of super of some of the last three Superman movies, <laughs> um, the Superman three, four, and the Supergirl movie, maybe they were a little bit gun shy about r- running too too maybe. hard and fast with it. But I was just shocked that they didn't pick up the ball and run with it. Yeah, and then the next um, after after the four Batman movies kind of ran their course, and they they scrapped the fifth one, which was going to be called Batman Triumphant, <laughs> with Harley Quinn. With was, Madonna as Harley Quinn. Uh, yeah, I, I, so after they scrapped that, because Batman and Robin did so poorly, um, the next big superhero movie was X-Men. Uh, mm, I don't know. I think in the appetizer for X-Men... It, it, X-Men was big, but I think the appetizer for X-Men was Blade. In 98? I credit Blade with, yeah. starting, with starting the Renaissance. Um, it, that, it was popular. It wasn't. A that was the, success, that was but, that was a year after Batman and Robin, right? But that was a year before. That was ninety eight. Um, but they Batman and Robin it was, was ninety seven. Popular movie, I think. 
97, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, 97, and then Blade was 98. Yeah, yeah. And then X-Men was 2000. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just getting my... <laughs> I don't, I forget, I forget stuff about Batman and Robin. I try to forget stuff about Batman and Robin. Um, but the funny thing is, it's all, um, it was just strange to me that they didn't grab the ball and run with it after Batman basically took over the world. Yeah, and um, I mean... Uh... It, it, I think I think that they kind of understood the limitations of where their technology was, and yeah. um, they didn't. Uh, they could do Batman because Batman was a man in a cape. He didn't fly. They could do practical stuff like the grapnel gun and stuff like that without having to uh, animate and matte paint and and try to do green screen and all the all the weird stuff that they ended up having to do with Christopher Reeve in the Superman movies and um yeah you, you know with with the with the flash or with um even with X-Men which they were trying to get an X-Men movie off the ground even as early as 1990 1991 yeah. 92 um and the 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 Roger Corman Fantastic 4 movie that that died as a slow and painful death that was completed with a music track and everything and yeah. never saw the light of day because of copyright problems. Um, it was a tax shelter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that whole movie was never meant to be released. It right, was a tax shelter. Right. So, um, and, and you know, they were trying to cast uh, X-Men and they were trying to work out how to do Spider-Man, which they didn't end up doing until 2002. Um, and, you know, they, they finally, with... with I, I guess I, I would say maybe Blade, but Blade wasn't as big and popular as, as X-Men ended up being. Um, it, it was it, an unexpected thing. People well, sure. didn't expect it. You know, mo Most people had not heard of Blade. Right, that's true. And they went to see the movie and they thought, hey, this is pretty good. You know, it's based on a Marvel comic? Yeah, and then it made some money. And then I, th I think, and I, I don't know this, I, I mm -hmm. do a little research, I think it gave the studio some confidence to say hey you know let, let's let's try something else because you know, it was if they, if they like this because it was it else. was rated r um yeah it wasn't the first rated r comic book movie i believe that the that the 1987 dolph lundgren punisher has the has the uh uh, uh pleasure of being the yeah did you ever see that one okay blade blade was the first good r rated <laughs> Comic book movie. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That Punisher was had so many problems. It was oh my so God. bad. It was just it awful. was so bad. Um, they Not, had to do Punisher at least four times before they got it right. Um, well, and and now with the with the Marvel cinematic universe uh, television side, Netflix side, him showing up in Daredevil season two. Yeah, they got the character yeah. right. I've never liked the Punisher to begin with. Um, I haven't either. I don't like the character. He's a psychopath. Um, <laughs> I don't like... The The only hero that I've ever liked that killed people was Wolverine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, that was it. And I knew why he was well, killing people. Coming back to Batman, we'll have to, we're going to wrap up here a little yeah. bit. Watching it the last two weeks, <laughs> it has dated a little bit. Um, a lot of the action scenes are a little stiff. A little? Um, that bat plane. Michael, Michael Keaton couldn't I, you move know, in that thing. <laughs> that whole uh, That was an 80-pound rubber suit. <laughs> yeah, and he couldn't move in it. How in the world he could ever fight in it, I don't know. But I, uh, um, There are things in the movie that I think are kind of lame. That scene where he goes up in the clouds and he's in front of the moon, the bat oh, yeah. in front of the moon, I thought that was... I always thought it was. It looked the cool, whole... but I never understood why he did it because the cloud cover was so thick, nobody would have been able to see him. Yeah, yeah. The whole. <laughs> let me tell you, the the car chase in this movie is clumsy as it can be. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just. <laughs> well, because car chase because is the awful. because the it Batmobile just... is clunky. It they, they can't turn. It's too big. There's no turn radius. It's too he long. He has to have a grappling hook to turn. Right, right. It's not a practical machine. It looks cool, but 
I mean, the car, the the Batmobile in the comics, and and later the Tumbler in the in the Nolan trilogy, it was actually a, like a good functional car and could do stuff. And in the comics, it was always a a good. It wasn't like long out in the in the in the front and everything like that whole thing. Like I can't even begin to understand the physics of the engine, or yeah. or how that car ran. Like where where was the engine? Was it sprawled out over that whole long uh, uh, front cab, or 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 what? I just I've it looks cool, but it is not a functional yeah. machine. Um, well, and not only that, but also um, just a lot of it. There they do a lot of practical effects, which I love practical effects, by the way. Mm. It's just a lot of it. A lot of the fight scenes are clumsy. Very. Um, and any time they try to use technology in this movie, any time they try to use any of Batman's um, wonderful toys, <laughs> it does feel a little clumsy. But nothing in this movie feels as clumsy as Kim Basinger. I don't See, think uh... she knew what to do in this movie. It was it, well, she doesn't have anything to work with. No, unless she has a moment when she's actually allowed to be a journalist, she is not allowed to be functional to this movie. She's just kind of there uh... with her, you know with her mouth gawping open. See, and any time the guys are in the room, she doesn't know <laughs> what to do. Vicky <laughs> Vicky Vale was not a good character in the comics either um she yep. was always just kind of there she was bruce's fiance for a while um she just she just she was just there i mean yeah i mean you say she she, the movie. you know she was she was clueless and she opened up that that box she was clueless <laughs> in the sh- in the in the in the comics too she had no idea that bruce wayne was batman he never told her and she was a reporter like she could never the figure it out like the- yeah, she's been to war torn countries. Yet she withers it just at the at the slightest, you know, moment of aggression. Yeah. Just, it's like it, it, yeah. it, uh, There's no there's no the consistency thing, of character at all. No, there's no consistency of character unless she's in the office or and she's in the field. Mm-hmm. Then she's actually a professional. But she can't be a professional when when Bruce Wayne is around. Or when Batman's around, or when Joker's around, she just sort of becomes just standing there gawping. When and when the when character... the when when the stuff is coming down, she's she's just a she's she turns into a damsel in distress, and right. she should have been a lot stronger of a character. Yeah, um, but one thing that people don't really give enough credit for, for my, for my taste in this movie, is Robert Wall. Mm. Um, I love Knox, and I mm-hmm. I missed Knox in the second one. I really did. Um, Knox is just such a fun character. He's he just is. a mouthpiece, and I love Robert Wall anyway. Yeah, me just, too. He's there to be his, the wisecracking guy, and I, I love this character. His stand up was always um, great too. When he when he still did stand up back in the back in the eighties mm-hmm. and early nineties, he his stand up was fantastic. Yeah. He um, he's just he's he's having fun in this movie. Mm-hmm. He's having fun, the fun that I hope that um, Kim Basinger would have. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to tell you, and this is going to be kind of my final thought on this: the lamest scene in this entire movie, the lamest scene in this entire movie, comes right at the very end when they unveil the bat signal. Oh yeah. Because yeah, this the the, uh, the Robert Wall steps forward and he says, "Well, how will how will we get his message?" And he says, "He sent us a signal," and he flips the signal on and the light comes on. It's this big searchlight, and then they show it against the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a cartoon, and they yeah. show it twice. Uh huh. <laughs> it just looks terrible. It looks like some kid drew it on the on the thing. <laughs> it just, I was like, well, they're, uh, well, at least they tried in in Batman Begins to make some kind of reality out of it, right? Know? At least they tried, but it just looks stupid, and it's purple. Yeah, it just, uh, yeah, so it, it, just, it just, and and that's you a know, clang at the end of the movie. Uh, <laughs> 
and you know, I've I've been I've been watching this movie now for twenty. 25 years. 28 years? Something. Something like that. 80, 89? So, yeah, 28 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I saw it in the theater as a as a 8-year-old kid, and I shouldn't have seen it as an 8-year-old kid. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no business. It, 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 anybody I, under the age of probably 12 would really need to see this movie. Yeah, I waited until my son was 13 to show it to him. He still hasn't seen the Dark Knight trilogy. Um, yeah. So, and so, I mean, uh, you said that it was one of my favorite movies. It's not really one of my favorite movies. It's it's something that I go back to. He's one of my favorite. He's my favorite. One of your favorite characters. My favorite character. Yeah. But I can't. I can't actually put any Batman movie as one of my favorite movies because they never quite get him right. Each one gets something better. Well, not each one. <laughs> like Batman and Robin got nothing right. But, nothing right. Um, well, I'll say, well, I'll give Batman and Robin defense for one thing, and that is, I think George Clooney played a decent Bruce Wayne. He did a play That's a great all Bruce I can Wayne. Say. Um, but anything else, he just he played a great public Bruce Wayne. The private yep. Bruce Wayne and Batman, he was, and he probably could play that. But he wasn't given an opportunity to play that properly. Right, right. Um, so, uh, you know, I love Batman, and I give every Batman actor and every Batman movie a shot. And I have yet to be fully fulfilled. I actually think that Ben Affleck has been the closest. But then I still like Christian Bale, <laughs> even though I know, I, even though I know his Batman sounds like he has a cold. Well. You know, <laughs> the, the it's we'll, cold. <laughs> we'll get we'll get to we'll get to the the Dark Knight trilogy at some point in this in this series, because yeah. um, I do, I do want to talk about them, um, and it was more like this. He talks like he has a bad cold and it fits the laryngitis. He can't get, and if you want something that makes a lot of fun of that. Um, Pete Holmes starred in a Funnier Die series as Batman, and uh, he as a clueless Batman. It's hilarious. There's a number of them. At one point, Patton Oswalt plays the, the Penguin. Um, oh God! And it, there was one one of them early on when they started doing it that he was trying to get his voice, and he and it's Pete Holmes going through all these different voices until he finally stumbles upon that one. And this criminal is helping him figure out which voice to use. It's hilarious. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I just... This this movie is, is still entertaining. It's still uh -huh. um, so well put together visually. Um, yeah. That even, even where the plot goes awry or where the technology goes awry the technology goes awry or the the script goes awry there's always something yeah. interesting going on visually or you know so, the, so, uh, uh, where where one part flags something else picks up the slack um, so like where where it might not be visually interesting the script actually kind of picks up a little bit or an actor picks up the the thing and makes that scene a little bit more interesting and it's not a great movie. It'll never be a great movie. No. Um, no. But it's a it's a good movie, and it's entertaining. And uh, Nicholson is is fantastic, and it, and Keaton is really good. Very surprising mm -hmm. in it. Um, even even after you've seen things like Birdman and uh, Spotlight and his more recent stuff, and and throughout his career, this is still a surprising turn for him. This became a, a role that was very hard for him to follow. Mm -hmm. um, Which is what Birdman he, plays off of. Yeah, Birdman, I'd say, if you want to see three movie, great movies, or four great movies from Michael Keaton, see Birdman, um, see... Um, Spotlight. Clean and Sober, Spotlight, and a movie called Game Six. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the films, those four films are the ones you need to see. Mm -hmm. um, if you really want to see his great dramatic work. Mm -hmm. um, 
and unfortunately, I think Batman will be on his headstone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, depending on what he does with the vulture. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen Thor yet, so. <laughs> Was it Thor? No, it's Spider-Man. No, it's, it's a, Spider-Man Homecoming. Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider-Man Homecoming. Um, yeah, we haven't seen him play Vulture yet, but no. uh, who knows. <laughs> so, so but anyway. I, guess I think that that, uh, that wraps it up here for us uh, on the Pod Bay Doors. Um, I am Doug Heller, again, of TalkMovieToMe.com. You can find me on Twitter at uh, TalkMovieToMe1. And, uh, Jerry, where can they find you on the social sphere? Always, I'm at armchaircinema.com, armchairoscars.com. I'm on Twitter at armchaircma, and I'm also on my blog at armchaircinema at WordPress. Hmm. And, uh, so that, uh, that kind of wraps everything up for us. The pod bay doors are closed. mission has been completed.